it goes back to antiquity. Yeah. Because if uh, you know, which one? Uh, you know, just the, the the bill hook in general. Right. You know, a pole arm with a hook on it, right? Yeah. Because actually. Uh, in one of Plato's dialogues called Laches, which means courage, mm. it starts out with uh, a couple of Plato's friends actually talking about uh, uh, having a conversation about fencing masters. And they, they uh, see Socrates, who's the character in that, and say, uh, Oh, Socrates, it's good to see you. We just came back from seeing a display of skill by a fencing master. And, you know, they call it Hoplomashi, which is uh, basically a, a master of arms. And, uh, their question for Socrates is, you know, is this a good thing? We were thinking of, you know, hiring this fencing master to train our children. Is it a good idea? And, you know, typical Plato, he gives both sides and never reaches a conclusion. And he says, you know, the first thing is, well, you know, um, if you're in warfare, often wars break down into single combats. And the more you know about wielding a weapon, the more efficient and effective you're likely to be. So yeah, some people say this is a good thing. But other people say that these fencing masters are never good fighters. They're never the good warriors. And in fact, you know, if you know those who, who can't do teach sort of a thing. Yeah. And he gives the example of one of these fencing masters who was um, actually on uh, in a naval combat when two ships were going past each other and he was fighting the other guys with this uh, extravagant weapon he, he describes. It was a pole, pole uh, some kind of a pole arm, but it had a hook on it. And he talks about mm -hmm. how during the course of, of fighting uh, the opposing ship with this uh, with this pole arm with a hook on it, mm. he got the hook tangled up in the rigging of the other ship going by, and he had to run down the length of his own ship trying to get the weapon untangled. <laughs> and then in the end, he never got it untangled and had to let go of it, and it went sailing off of the <laughs> vessel. And everyone on his own ship was laughing at him, and he was a laughing stock. So he used this as an example of how these fencing masters really are are nothing special. But what's interesting about it is it gives you that idea that even in, in classical times, classical Greek times, mm. they have some kind of a pole arm, mm. you know, that has a hook on it, yeah, which yeah. just goes to show that certainly with, you know, arms and armor, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. So this is a really interesting uh, Zavai hander, or Biden hander. Um, it looks, all looks good to me, the proportions and everything, but the blade actually gets wider as we go down. It's not just obviously the perspective, so if we're to zoom out, we're actually over a fireplace here, so it is on a slope, uh, but despite the fact that you've got a slope, that blade is actually widening towards the tip and then ending in quite a triangle, isn't it? And Matt, you said you've seen this before on... Yeah, I've actually uh, seen this in quite a few of these, uh, so it's not uncommon to have that sort of slightly spatulate tip yeah. and then it comes in almost like, sort of like a... Or a triangle really, yeah. Yeah, a triangle or a chisel, however you want to think of that. Yeah. So, interesting, broadened at the tip presumably so you've got maximum hitting force at the end and then just making the, the end pointy for when you want to use the point. We've got another one behind here which the blade's more parallel edged all the way along. Very nice guard with a fleur de, fleur de lis uh, in the guards. And then in the middle we've got a more simple one that's almost more like what we see in Morozzo. Um, straight blade, small lugs sticking out. Notice the lugs are much much smaller. Look if I just go from lug to lug. The right hand sword here, massive lugs, about what five inches long, and here only about one inch long. Um, and a more simple hilt. But if we come down here, where does the blade go? It stops. <laughs> and I just go under here, you actually see the blade is broken. So these did obviously sometimes break. I assume all of these are original, they all look good to me. Um, and we've got a couple of crossbows on the side as well. Uh, what is it, whatever it is, 1807, 1809, he, he specifically mentions that. And he has a diagram that shows that. He calls that little clip, Unia de Gato. Unia de Gato. Unia de Gato, which is the cat's claw. So the clip, what we'd call a clip point right. or a falchion point um, is a Unia de Gato, cat's claw in Spanish. That's pretty cool. And this sword's got, not only has it got a sort of toothed sawback edge, presumably for bushcraft or such like, but it's also got weird piercings that go right the way through the blade. Um, which of course we do see on other types of sword, but they look quite close to the back edge on this one. Well, there's the, the crescent. Yeah. 
crescent and stars. Yeah, interesting. And then a guard, which I would say is relatively, I wouldn't say it's typical, but it's very characteristic of um, guards from about the 1760s to 1780s, um, and you find it on both British and American swords, uh, usually with a spadroon or a hanger blade. In this case, it is a hanger blade, but an unusual hanger blade. Uh, flank officer's sabre, uh, non-regulation, very fancy guard, probably light cavalry officer's sabre. Then what I believe to be a French, possibly Russian, but probably French light cavalry officer's sword. Then a 1788 pattern light, mm, something like a 1788 pattern, I think. Uh, light cavalry sword, then above that a, a non-regulation 1796 light cavalry officer sword with a straighter blade than normal. And then finally, very lovely sword at the top, uh, sabre with what we call an assault guard uh, with fold out sections either side with a leaf spring to hold them in position. So bars fold out on left and right to form a basket hilt and that probably dates to about 1795. So this is a Colt 1851 Navy, but it's a good example of what's sometimes called the London Navy um, because uh, it's actually this. I don't know if this is a London made example, but a typically British feature is this decoration. And um, what you'll find, you can see on the cylinder there, is the original Colt naval battle scene from the uh, American-Mexican War that gives the Colt Navy its name. But all of this uh, kind of acanthus or floral decoration that's put on that we also find on swords of the period is a very typically British feature. So this is an example of essentially an American revolver made for the British market. Although in this case it may indeed have been made in Britain or Belgium because they were made on license as well. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.